thank you, Ms. Graftiza. And again, uh, welcome and good evening to our town hall where we are setting our district goals for the year. Um, we would like to um, let you know that this is a different format. It isn't a regular public meeting. And so you will experience um, different aspects of the town hall. So good evening, Dr. Cascone. Good evening, my fellow board members. Uh, and good evening, uh, Mrs. Flowers. Would you kindly do the roll call, please? Yes, thank you, President Trick Scales. Good evening, everyone. Roll call, please. Mrs. Huerta? Here. Mrs. Merklinger? Here. Mr. Rothstein? Here. Vice President Tunnycliffe? Here. President Trick Scales? Here. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mrs. Flowers. Um, just before we jump into the meat of the evening, I just want to um, give our public an overview of how we got to this point. Um, as the board last year set goals, one of the goals was to increase uh, public engagement through having two town halls. We had our first town hall for um, what was our first town budget. hall for? <laughs> for the budget, <laughs> just a, a brain freeze. For the budget, uh, that was back in November, I believe. And this brings us to this evening where we are working on our district goal setting. Um, in the past, at least the past couple of years, the administration and the board has worked together to develop the district goals and the board has worked to develop its own board goals. But we wanted to do things differently this time and we wanted to include our stakeholders. So we are actually triangulating this process where we are including our stakeholders, then the administration will be involved and then the board will be involved. And so we know that a survey um, was distributed a short while ago and a number of people participated and we are happy that you did participate and that's what's going to happen tonight. So at this point I'm going to, oh, and I wanted to just also explain um, how we've organized this evening. So all of us, each board member, as well as Dr. Cascone has had a role to play. Dr. Cascone and I worked on setting up the initial survey questions. Um, our PR committee, which consists of Ms. Huerta and Ms. Merklinger, worked on pushing out the survey, doing the public relations, getting it out to the public and the PTAs. And then our logistics committee, which consists of uh, Mr. Rothstein and Mrs. Tunnycliffe, worked tonight, tonight's format. And so this has been a team effort. And as I like to say, there's no I in team. We've all worked um, equally hard to bring this to you this evening. And so we're just happy that you're with us. And so I'm gonna turn it over to our logistics team. So Mr. Rothstein, are you starting? Or Ms. Tunnycliffe, uh, well, Vice President. I, yeah, we're actually starting uh, with, uh, with Mrs. Tunnycliffe and thank you very okay. much for setting it up for us. And, uh, and also, again, thank you to everybody. I, I, I appreciate you commenting that this was a team effort. There were a lot of pieces to, to bring this together. And uh, thanks to everyone for making this happen. Thank you. Ms. Graftiza, will we be able to see the slides? Thank you so much. So um, 
thanks to everyone who's here tonight and for those of you who did complete our survey and provide feedback in advance we truly appreciate that and for those who may not have had an opportunity to take the survey but are here um, we're looking forward to your feedback as well so thank you um, so much so why we're doing this town hall we had talked um, as President Trigg Scales had said that we wanted to include more feedback from our constituents um, and the various communities within our district. Um, so the purpose of this is really so that we can get a better understanding of the feedback that you gave us from the survey and to better understand um, the priorities that were communicated to us um, as we move forward over the next month or so to develop the goals for this year. So. Um, Mr. Rothstein, do you want to add yes, anything? Thank you. Uh, no, I think uh, we can go ahead and advance to the next slide. And I, I know that that many people on the call love, as I do, to spend uh, their weekend reading through the Board of Education website. And uh, so you've probably come across the board goals and the district goals as you were perusing this. Uh, so there's an these are on the website going back a number of years, as you can see on the left and right, some images of previous years um, uh, board and district goals. So what happens is both groups adopt goals annually. And uh, the purpose of this is to really reflect what the priorities are going to be to focus on in the school year ahead. And I, I wanna emphasize that what we're talking about here is priorities. These are not the only things that we focus on. As you all know, there's so many things going on in, in the operation of a school district. But what this does is allows us to choose some things in advance, some, some priorities and goals that we really want to accomplish in the upcoming year, and therefore on a year-to-year -year basis, be able to make progress on any number of areas that might otherwise fall through the cracks. Um, so, since there are two separate sets of goals, some of the uh, goals on each list might align. Some of them might be different. That's okay. These are slightly different um, groups, the, the district, uh, the administration running the dis district and the board overseeing the operations. And so um, typically we focus on three to five goals per list. And we want these to be things that are really achievable. They, they should be able to be accomplished and measured. And uh, the Board of Education conducts an annual self-evaluation. So we actually fill out a somewhat lengthy form evaluating um, the board on the work that it's done in the previous year. And a part of that evaluation is targeted toward how successfully we've accomplished our goals and in what areas we could have made improvements. So these actually really do serve a purpose besides driving us forward um, uh, on a particular set of priorities they help us evaluate the work that we're doing to serve the public and to serve our students. Um, and then lastly, the board will also evaluate the superintendent annually. And in part that's based on whether the district goals have been accomplished and how well. So uh, all of this really does become an important part of the operations of the board. And as you'll hear us say many times here, we're looking forward to hearing from you to help inform those decisions that are gonna be made toward drafting the goals in the upcoming year. And Thank you, wait. Mr. Rothstein. Um, can we switch to the next slide, please? Thank you, Ms. Groff Tiza. Um, so basically the steps in the process were to collect input. So right now we're in the input collecting phase. We, we've done the survey and that was created and we gathered information. We're gonna go through um, some of the findings tonight and hopefully with your feedback, try to refine them a little bit. Um, and as Mr. Rothstein said, this input helps inform both the Board of Ed goals as well as the district priorities. Um, and then as we, you know, the next step for us was we will convene as a board and, um, we will, and the school district and the administrators will work on their section for the district goals. And they'll create, we'll both create two independent sets of goals um, for the year. So, um, and then 
hopefully by July, our July meeting, these will all be ready and we'll be able to adopt those um, at our July meeting. So um, one other note I wanted to say is in, in terms of stakeholder input, we will be getting student feedback. Um, what we will do is give them the draft of our goals and then have the student councils review those and then come back to us uh, with any additional feedback that they might want to incorporate in that. Mr. Rothstein? So a little bit about, uh, oh, if we can- if So we can advance the slides, the slide. please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so a little bit about the people who responded to the survey. Um, we had uh, 235 um, community members, basically people who have children uh, in the school district and 226 staff members uh, respond to the survey. And you can see the breakdown on the screen uh, here. Uh, the uh, majority of the parents had students in uh, grades K through five, uh, with the second largest group being in the nine through 12, and uh, the, the rest of the grades uh, making up the difference there. And in terms of respondents um, from the staff, 43% uh, K through five, so strong representation from the uh, elementary schools. And then, uh, 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 nine through 12 in the 18 to 21 uh, school uh, program, 31%, and six to eighth grades at 26%. So uh, uh, a good mix um, of grade levels uh, among the faculty, uh, a pretty good mix of the community as well. Uh, and uh, uh, we appreciate everybody who participated in this. And just a little more information on the next slide uh, about who participated. <laughs> And this just basically shows the respondents by ethnicity. So we'd have uh, the following categories. Asian um, is in the darker blue. The Hispanic population is uh, in the orange. The multiracial is in the gray. Uh, black is the yellow. And then the unclassified is the lighter blue. And then the white is the largest um, group at 54%. So those are the respondents by ethnicity in case anyone is curious as to um, our demographics on that. You can advance the slide. I was about to say as a reminder about the survey, but as a reminder to myself to unmute my microphone. Um, for anyone who took the survey, you may recall um, from the images here that this is what it looked like for anyone on the line who didn't participate. We had a number of questions broken out into two groupings. One grouping was curriculum instruction and assessment. The other grouping operations, planning, student and community engagement. Um, in the first group, there were six options to select from. And we asked uh, participants to rank from one being the least important to six being uh, greatest importance. And uh, in the operations and planning section, there were four questions and ranking from one to four. Uh, and then there was also an open-ended question because we wanted to be able to take some feedback that wasn't necessarily addressed in these um, options that were offered. Uh, so once the, once the um, rankings were submitted, uh, there was a tabulation done uh, awarding points based on which ranking each category was given, and those were added up. And you'll see in a few moments, we'll give you the results of all of this. Uh, so uh, we were able to determine what, what seems to be being communicated to us by um, the community and by the faculty uh, about which of these areas is of greatest importance to them. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so for the curriculum instruction and assessment um, bucket, uh, it was it's notable that in a year where people rarely agreed on anything, um, that we did have the community and our faculty and staff um, having the same priorities as the top priorities. Um, they differed a little bit by points, um, as you can see, um, but certainly the instruction curriculum in 21st century skills um, was the highest um, for the community. Um, and it was, uh, I think, third highest for the staff. Um, then it was the uh, address the um, social emotional learning, which was high for both the um, 
the community and certainly for the staff that's first and foremost in their mind it seems and then we had the serving specialized student populations coming in um, second for the staff and then um, I think fourth for the community and then the addressing learning loss and learning acceleration um, was you know not not too far um, from each other uh, and that that was also uh, one of the top things that that people had looked at um, and then um, just a, a note that you know well grading and assessment and college and career readiness may not be as high up on the priority list for what everybody's looking at it's still you know a critical component of what we we will be working on this year um, it's just you know didn't rise to the top of the the list um, on this so mr rothstein thank you and yeah pl please advance to the next slide so in our second set of uh of questions um uh, we had uh, rankings of areas of equity and access, facilities or school buildings, strategic planning, and parent engagement. And again, we saw a lot of alignment between both groups, the uh, uh, community members with students in the school and with the staff. Um, equity and access ranking highest for both groups, parent engagement ranking lowest by, for both groups, although not by a lot. And then facilities and buildings and strategic planning reversed in second and third place for both groups. But again, very close in, in uh, the total number of points assessed for each. So uh, again, want to reflect it's interesting and I think a, a good thing that we seem to see some alignment there and some interesting results and certainly a clear winner in terms of uh, equity and access in this group. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, please move yeah, forward. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> So, and there were a few things, um, as Mr. Rosti mentioned in his introduction, that there were some items that we thought um, we'd like to share, just sort of a broad brush of some of the things that people were talking about um, in the open-ended questions. And of course, first and foremost in anybody, everybody's mind is the school reopening and you know, what that's going to look like. There were lots of uh, comments about that. Um, you know, as the governor said, we're planning to be open five days, um, full days in September. So, um, you know, that that is, you know, certainly our goal. Um, social emotional learning was another um, highly prioritized um, comment in throughout the comments uh, that we received uh, that was first and foremost in both teachers and staff as well as our community members um, to make sure that our children are doing well coming out of this pandemic and um, seeing how they're doing first. Um, so that was certainly important. Um, and then there were some other things, you know, facilities, very important to many people as well. Um, and then a couple of really interesting kind of things, you know, certainly talking about honors and AP programs, which is always um, something that our, our, our families look to um, get more information about and understand where we're going. Um, student involvement and goals setting, the inclusion, that was a big issue as well. Uh, there was a comment about healthier cafeteria foods and what we can do with that. And we just had that presentation last week with Mashia. So I think they're already in the process of thinking about that and, uh, you know, in terms of nutrition and making sure all of our students are well fed. Um, there were some comments about upgrading playgrounds, um, evidence-based education and sharing of best practices between schools. Um, and, you know, areas of where we can save in terms of finances. What are we not seeing? What, what are we not looking at? Um, so that was something that uh, both parents and staff uh, had mentioned. Um, and then I thought it was really, you know, they talked about trauma-informed care training for teachers and, you know, coming out of this pandemic, what additional needs and professional development do our teachers need to deal with, you know, what has just happened and what these children are going through um, and what they're going through. Um, you know, many people have lost family members, um, both in our community as well as our teachers and our, our staff. Um, so looking at, at it through that lens of, of trauma-informed care. Um, and staff well-being. Um, there were some comments about staff diversity, um, what we're doing in, in terms of that. 
um, the technology programs. There were comments about um, not only programmatic and curriculum, but also kind of how do we incorporate this virtual experience that we just came to into education on a more regular basis? What are some of the ideas that we can um, incorporate? So I think that's something, you know, we'd be interested to hear more from you, our listeners today, to um, give us some guidance on that. And we can go to the next slide. And Mr. Rothstein. Thank you so much. So we're, we're really into the part, uh, this is the setup to open the microphones and start hearing from, uh, from those who have dialed in to this meeting tonight. And what you've seen in the previous slides is what the survey questions were, the results that we got from them that um, the, the school administration and the Board of Education will be looking at to, as I said, help inform our decision-making process as we develop our set of goals for the upcoming school year. What we're really hoping to tease out this evening is a little more detail and input um, from the uh, attendees at the meeting tonight to help us maybe gain, gain a little bit more perspective as we head into our deliberations around our goals for next year. So. Uh, I'm just going to read through this uh, uh, briefly. We actually have um, two sets of questions. This first one is on the, the first group from the survey curriculum instruction and assessment. What we'll do is look at these, open up to hear some comments uh, from attendees at the meeting tonight. Then we'll move on after that to the next slide, look at the second set of questions, uh, which, um, which is from the second group uh, in the survey. And then... Um, uh, take questions or comments on those as well. And uh, uh, really looking forward to hearing some feedback. So you've seen the survey results, uh, some general questions, conversation starters, what's missing from that? What are the details that you can offer to us uh, to help communicate to us what your priorities are and what you would like to see reflected uh, in our deliberations for goal setting? Um, are there specific areas when we talk about instruction and curriculum and 21st century skills what in your experience would you like to see addressed at your schools that maybe you haven't seen addressed yet? That can be helpful to us in determining uh, uh, how, how heavily to focus uh, our goals on that and in what direction. Um, social, emotional learning, safety, mental health, we know that those are critical important, uh, critically important. What's most important to you? What would you like to see uh, in the upcoming school year, especially after uh, such a challenging year that we've come through? Uh, learning loss, learning acceleration, again, important topics. Um, uh, we need your thoughts on this. We need to know uh, uh, what you'd like to see addressed coming up. Uh, and in starting this new school year, how can we better address the needs of our specialized student, excuse me, our specialized student populations? Um, hopefully we've, uh, we've got some speakers who can give us some insight into what they're looking for. And uh, let's see. Uh, uh, preparation for college and career, uh, uh, a very important one. I think, I think especially in the high school groups, but it certainly starts earlier than that. Uh, but what additional steps could be helpful to you uh, or would have been helpful to your child if they're graduating? Um, uh, that's good information for us to have. And finally, the uh, grading and assessment was ranked last in the, uh, in the set of options that were presented. And we were curious to know whether you think that this will be a more important issue in the upcoming year. Maybe it's something that just wasn't top of mind and didn't carry, didn't seem to carry the same importance uh, right now for many people in the community. Just interested to hear a little more detail on that to help us interpret and understand the results that we saw. So I think what we wanna do is hold with this set of questions at the moment and um, give everyone an opportunity to just sort of look at those, think them through. And by the way, this, uh, this can be open-ended too. If there are other items within this grouping that you'd like to discuss, please uh, mm -hmm. feel free to, uh, to jump in with those questions. But do know that we'll have um, a second set of questions that we'll come to later that dealt with the other set, uh, the other grouping of options that were discussed in the survey that was operations, planning, student and community engagement. So we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so, Ms. Kravtisa, I think that we're um, at a point right now where um, we would like to hear from, uh, from any of the attendees on this meeting who have some thoughts that they'd like to share with us. 
Sure. Would you like me also to include the Q and A function or just uh, vocal? Yeah, I, th I think including the Q and A function is uh, is a good idea too. If someone would rather type a question, um, understand that what we'd like to do is read it out loud. Sure. Uh, yeah, so that there's uh, an opportunity for everyone to uh, to benefit from that, and maybe a follow up question that we can ask. Absolutely. Um, so those who are familiar with our board meetings, uh, you may uh, know the raise your hand function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And we do encourage you to press that button if you'd like to speak and ask your question verbally. Um, maybe if you're not as comfortable, a little shy, there's also the Q&A function, which is located to the right of that button at the bottom of your screen. And you can simply type in your question um, into the box. And as uh, Mr. Rothstein said, it will be read aloud and it will be answered for you uh, that way. So at this time, if anyone does have any questions that they'd like to ask, um, there feel free to either use the raise your hand function located at the bottom of your screen, and that will put you into the queue or using the Q&A function, which is the box located to the right of your raise your hand function. And don't be shy, someone has to be first. <laughs> I'm a big fan of just letting an awkward silence hover for a little <laughs> while until someone feels I guilty. I don't into. have any music queued up. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I said I'm a big fan of that. And in the meantime, I'm talking right over that beautiful awkward silence, so. Please don't be shy. We're very friendly here, and we really are genuinely curious to hear um, to hear your thoughts on any one of these items or uh, or whatever you would like to share with us. Right. Oh yes, thank you. Uh, you can actually remain anonymous when you're doing the um, the question in the Q and A. Thank you. And as I was saying that, an anonymous attendee did um, bring up a question. How do we reconcile the past year in terms of social emotional well being? Every child I know has been harmed psychologically. How can we enhance the school experience to embrace our students and warm them up to school again in a kind of loving way? Yeah, certainly, I think a question that's uh, that's on all of our minds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, uh, wondering what the best way to uh, uh, to address this is. Um, I don't know, uh, President Trigg Scales, if uh, if um, we want to respond in the same way that we would normally in a in a uh, in a normal school board meeting. Uh, yeah, I, I think that would be appropriate. And we're certainly going to add this to um, our priorities here um, as well. But since it is a question for the evening, uh, perhaps Dr. Cascone would like to take a first shot at it. Sure. Uh, thank you, President Trick Scales. Um, so, <clears throat> so I kind of, and, and of course, I'm, 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 I'm just a um, you know, kind of in, in many ways an observer to this this work of the board here. Um, but I might suggest that, you know, the, the questions that we receive um, are as much to, as much of about informing um, our thought process and our planning moving forward um, in terms of not only setting the district goal, but I can provide a little bit of context. So um, this week I sent out a, as you're aware, the board is aware, um, I sent out a an interest uh, survey or form to the staff um, for uh, staff members, both certificated and non-certificated, who would be interested in uh, participating in voluntary uh, school reopening committees uh, this summer. Um, now, we'll tell you that um, it is our intention to also offer opportunities for community members to participate on those community. I'm sorry, on those committees as well. And there are three separate subcommittees. One is related to curriculum instruction and assessment. One is related to health and safety and one is related to mental health and social emotional supports. And so you know, those committees are going to convene and in their first meeting will really be kind of, you know, throwing up kind of brainstorming and kind of throwing up key essential questions that then will drive the planning. But I think it's a great question. And I think we need to be extremely thoughtful um, about how we are not only opening the school year, uh, but over the course of that year, another sort of, you know, kind of tangent to that is, 
um, is through obviously the our grant, our uh, American Rescue Plan uh, ESSER three grant, which we're kind of coming to a close on as we continue to receive community feedback. A big portion of that uh, grant is dedicated to uh, mental health and social emotional support. One of the things that Ms. Butler, um, our Director of Student Counseling is exploring now is uh, the adoption of specifically a mental health curriculum um, that's delivered by um, our uh, mental health slash social emotional curriculum that's delivered by our, primarily by our guidance counselors on the elementary level um, and the, the middle and high school level. Um, typically what we uh, are the curriculum that's delivered by those staff members is a is a character ed um, curriculum um, and not to say that that's not um, that's not important um, but what we're looking at is really front loading uh, the year with a mental health curriculum for students mm -hmm. so you know the the <clears throat> pushing that out and and um, certainly I think you know based upon the results that we got from the survey and the emphasis that both our community members and our staff placed on social emotional learning and mental well-being, it's becoming clear that that it's very likely that one of the district goals will be dedicated specifically to that. Um, threshing out what that goal looks like um, is what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, but it's a it's an excellent question. It's a valid question, and definitely one that's going to be driving the goal setting and the planning. Thank you, Dr. Cascone. You're welcome. That's Hi, I, if I if I might just add something, I uh, just listened to a presentation today that um, our vice president Tunnycliffe participated in, and um, one of the principals talked about stamina. Uh, we've all been in a different mode for the last 15 months, and then you add the summer that's coming up, and by the time we get to September. And she talked about the importance of allowing both staff and students and, and parents to get back into the routine of a full day of school. We haven't done that in a very, very long time. And I thought that that was um, really, really important for us to, to think about and to make sure that we're not trying to make up all this lost time, this this um, this lost learning, but to accelerate students and to make it fun, to make it enjoyable to come back to school um, and, and get our feet wet once again. Um, we, we've been sitting in front of computers where you can, you know, cut your camera off and take a stretch, um, take a drink. Um, close your eyes for a second, whatever the need may be. A parent told me the other night she loves our virtual board meetings because she does it in her jammies. And so, you know, we, we've all lived a different lifestyle. And so I think it's really going to be important um, for us to consider all of that um, as we get ready to reopen the schools. And as Dr. Cascone said, that that's definitely one of our priorities. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. The next question we have uh, is from Lauren Weinshank, and um, they state, my child has had her fun day at her elementary school, and the staff were measuring with a tape measure that they were sitting six feet apart outside. This perpetuates fear and anxiety, and how will staff be trained to ease into normalcy while maintaining safety? Yeah, I think like as I'm looking at that, so I'm trying to look at, at you know, these first two questions or comments uh, uh, through the lens of how we're going to filter this through into, into goals and into goal setting. And I really see this as being something akin to the question a moment ago about social emotional learning and mental health and, uh, and something that we saw reflected in the results that so many people felt was a, a clear um, uh, one of the clear priorities to be addressed this year. And yeah, I think that, uh, you know, so, so far the trend with two questions is um, uh, making sure that some of our uh, goal setting is focused on the, really the peculiarities of, of the past, uh, the past uh, school year and a half and the impression that that's had on our students and really on our faculty as well and what we can do in order to help, um, uh, you know, may, maybe in some ways get back to normal and maybe in some ways um, use it to propel ourselves into better than normal. 
Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, in interesting to see, uh, uh, you know, so far in, in the first two responses, that focus. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to just mention that, you know, if you have a suggestion that's under the curriculum and instruction, you know, feel free to share that with us as well, because it might be something that, um, <clears throat> you know, we've not thought of. Um, we, we love hearing suggestions and uh, want to be able to incorporate those as well into our thinking uh, about goal setting. So um, feel free to chat those in or pop them into the question and answer. Or raise your hand. <laughs> so maybe I'm wondering, do we want to move on to the second set of questions? And um, and then, of course, remind everyone that, uh, you know, you don't have to feel uh, stuck to the questions that are on the screen. But, uh, you know, as thoughts occur to you um, uh, or something compels you to want to share your thoughts to help us as we're developing our priorities, we do want to hear yep. from you. Sure. Also, maybe um, there, that we're not limiting to one question or one comment. Mm -hmm. So if more comments or questions come up, feel free yes. to type them in or raise your hand. Right, not like a regular board member meeting where you only have one opportunity to talk either at the beginning or at the end in the public comment se sections. If you, something else occurs right. to you, you're welcome to um, state that as well. Uh, so thank you, Ms. Huerta for, for suggesting that. Okay, so um, the next bucket of questions we had was around operations planning, student and community engagement. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly run through these. And um, if you have any other questions or you have comments of how we might consider working with these questions um, or other questions that we should be considering as we develop our goals, uh, feel free to to put those into the uh, Q&A. Um, so first, you know, we kind of want to get a sense of how you feel about the survey results. Are these accurate? Do you feel something is missing? Um, do, you know, what additional detail can you offer to us to communicate your priorities? I think this is an opportunity for, um, all of us to kind of drill down on those various streams that were that kind of surfaced and be able to target things a little bit more specifically. So I think we're looking for a little bit more specificity. Um, and as I say that, you know, we're looking at what specific areas for within equity and access that require more attention, you know, um, school facilities, parent engagement, you know, that's a pretty broad subject. So, um, you know, we'd like to have a better understanding of what that means to you. Um, and then, you know, as we think about our goals, our five year strategic plan is coming to a close. And this year, the board and the district will start to review um, the past five years um, strategic plan and start to develop our new plan. And um, we would really welcome your thoughts on how we should conduct that process and what should be included in the long term plan for our district. Um, you know, I may remind those of you who are, might be new to the district that five years ago, we did a series, I think it was three different meetings where the community had opportunities to come in and it was kind of targeted and focused and kind of narrowed down as we went through the three meetings about different things. Um, you know, the first one was sort of very a visionary meeting and kind of really what do you want education to look like and then it kind of drilled down from there. So that's one way to do it. Are there other ways that, you know, we should be looking at how to approach our five-year strategic plan. Um, and then, you know, the facilities um, at our schools, that was something that was, um, you know, many, many folks said we need to be addressed. What specifically? We know there's some, you know, um, we know we are using some of our ESSER funds that are coming in, the ESSER three funds that are coming in to address some of those issues. Are there other things that are not HVAC related that might be um, a priority for your schools? So um, let us know about that. Uh, also, um, you know, how, how do we effectively communicate with parents and community? Um, do these town halls work for you? I mean, are our idea of engagement is, um, you know, we're sort of limited in the format of the way the board meeting runs. So we hope that these offer an, a better way for you to 
talk, you know, talk to us and give us your feedback. Um, but are there other things that we should be doing? Um, you know, I think one of the things we hope to do next year is to get to PTA meetings where all of the board members will go and to be at a PTA meeting. Um, you know, we do have the council of PTAs, but what other things are, do you think might help us connect more with our community and with all of you? Um, and then finally, and kind of in the same vein are, you know, how do we better engage families? I mean, that again was fairly low rated, um, having come out of um, PTA leadership roles. I know that was always something that was in the forefront of my mind. And I know a lot of other PTA leaders feel the same way that, you know, that is a really important piece of engaging families. We want people to be engaged. We want people to um, feel they have a good rapport with their teachers and their principals and their, you know, um, guidance counselors that they're, you know, these are all resources for your child. So, um, you know, what other ways should we be looking at that? Um, so those are, those are just a couple of things. So if there's um, other questions, I think there's. We do, we have one. Oh, great. Uh, another anonymous attendee. Sure. Um, how can we begin to meet students where they are in curriculum and instruction? How can we get those struggling to where they need to be while also keeping those not struggling moving forward and not stalling as has been what I have observed? That's I, I view that as, uh, as um, falling under I think one of the uh, options that existed in the survey, the addressing learning loss and learning acceleration, uh, both ends of that in the question here. And yeah, again, absolutely things that we're, uh, uh, that I, I know we're thinking about as we're making plans for the upcoming year. And that was ranked by the way, very high. It was um, uh, top four for both categories for community and for, uh, uh, and for faculty. Okay, and we do have another one uh, from Anonymous. Hi, I am a fourth grader at St. Cloud School. It's really bothering me that you say you are taking away science and social studies honors classes in sixth grade. All of my teachers say you can do hard things, but how can I have the chance to fail and do hard things if there is nothing hard to do? First of all, thank you so much for attending a, a meeting like this tonight. Something that not many, uh, uh, not many sixth graders would uh, would sit through. Uh, and so, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and again, I think that the the heart of that question I see very much uh, in in the same as the previous question, uh, really addressing learning education, and or, I'm sorry, learning uh, acceleration, and how we can. Uh, uh, how we can get things moving at a uh, uh, at an appropriate pace for all of our students as we're coming back into school. Um, definitely a very good question and something that we all need to work hard on. Yeah, and I think that goes to um, the sort of diversity within the classroom in terms of diversifying the curriculum so that there's multiple which was part of the, the questions um, and some of the feedback that we got on the comments section too, so. Right, as well as questions or comments about honors classes. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, uh, yes. go ahead. Yeah, I just want to just interject. I think, and, and I certainly agree that this is definitely about learning loss and those students that um, are looking to for higher achievement. But I think this one, and, and definitely to the student that sent this in, I think this is more about the honors program um, and just, I think, looking at our curriculum and instruction, not just necessarily from learning loss and the achievement gap of what, um, and differentiation in the classroom, um, but also what we're offering in terms of classes. So I think this looks more is, and I could be completely wrong on this, but I think it sounds like maybe looking at, um, because it specifically says social studies and science, and I think those are the two that we removed for honors from for sixth grade. So maybe just taking another look at that as we uh, look into our development of our goals. Yeah, I, I, and I can chime in here um, if, if, if uh, the board will allow. Certainly. Uh, um, you know, honors, the, the honors is a, it's a, um, it's a complex conversation. Um, 
you know, there are strong beliefs, you know, on opposite sides, strong philosophies and differing philosophies on honors. Um, you know, there it's sort of the same conversation around the generations old um, debate over tracking, right? Now, there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong answer. I think it is what is what it what is the will the overall will of the community and i do think and i've and i've spoken with the administrative team that a an honors committee next year um to really unpack what we do presently um and um what is it that um we're trying to accomplish what is it that our community wants um there are many many school districts and, and just to kind of show my hand philosophically, I think sixth grade's a little bit early to be putting kids in honors, to be completely frank with you. And I think there's a variety of different reasons for that. Um, you know, to be, to, be, to be tracking kids at, at, at such a young age, I don't necessarily think is constructive. I think what also is difficult is that our kids come from seven different elementary schools. Um, and in, you know, as much as I would like to say that the experiences are consistent across the board, that's not necessarily the case. We also know that the transition from elementary school to middle school in of itself represents a ramping up in expectations. For example, it's the first grade level where kids are moving from class to class. It's the first um, grade level where all of their courses are departmentalized. Um, you know, where they they have a different teacher for every one of their subjects. So those adjustments in of themselves um, represent a significant change in the learning environment. And as such, one could certainly make a reasonable and strong argument that it makes sense to give kids a year to acclimate to that new level, their first year in secondary education before starting to track them. Because you know, just there may be some students who um, as fifth graders aren't necessarily ready for honors in sixth grade. Um, and there may be some, you know, that are. So, so it's a complex conversation with a lot of different philosophies around it. And I do think that as a community, we're in a place where we need to start having an inclusive conversation about it and try and chart a course that to the best extent possible represents a compromise from all parties. But it is something after a lot of feedback this year from parents, that I've realized we need to take a close look at it next year. It needs to be an inclusive conversation um, and we need to evaluate what we do and if any changes are necessary. And I think I, I recall from a previous uh, discussion about this and this would, you know, I think fall into, uh, into the spirit of the, the question that was posed uh, is while honors is one possible answer and honors track is one possible answer, across the board, it also has to do with um, finding appropriate ways to challenge students at all levels uh, across all of the classes. And that's, I think, where I was looking more at not the learning loss side of the question that was posed in the survey, but the learning acceleration side of it. How is it that we pick up and accelerate and make sure that we're meeting students where they're at and taking them where they need to go um, at every level that we're offering? And, and that's something that I think is sort of, uh, um, a goal worthy question. Agreed. I, I think, Mr. Rothstein, I think that that question that the uh, community member raised is could could represent a goal in of itself. Um, and I can tell you that it is obviously, you know, top of mind, you know, for the admin team. And, and it's not something that we haven't not been preparing for yet. Um, certainly, the process that we went through a number of weeks ago, whereby we were collecting um, performance student achievement data on every student um, and have down to the student level in key skill areas where that student is, whether it's on grade level, above grade level, or below grade level, we have that data. So it's not as if we're in the dark with respect to um, where students are when they're going into next year. The question remains, and it's a great question, is okay, what do we do for, you know, to, to, for those students who are behind? That's a little bit of an easier question because we do have support capacities already in place through basic skills, through reading specialists, uh, as well as um, through um, the new grant that we're writing, or as the second grant, the SR2 grant was dedicated specifically to the summer, 
Um, as for three, we've built money into what I'm calling kind of sidecar support during the school year and being responsive to feedback that we receive from the community, ensuring that that programming is not only, um, for lack of a better word, and I hate this word, but remedial, but that that sidecar programming is also uh, acceleration programming as well, enrichment programming. Um, so we, you know, we are beginning conversations. We're, we're making decisions uh, presently with a critical eye on that, but it's going to require a much more focused approach. Um, and I think I think a big part of that is going to be um, and feedback we've received from teachers, particularly elementary teachers, is the importance of having grade level planning time. It's not something that we've really had a lot of time to do in the last year and a half. This can be really critical early and often in the year to provide teachers of the same grade level opportunities uh, to have co collaborative planning. It's through those kinds of conversations and planning that I think this question is gonna get threshed out in detail. Um, if I may also, Dr. Cascone, I do like the idea of having the honors committee. Um, and I think that the um, including students would be helpful um, to gain their perspective on what's working for them and what they, because they're the ones that are doing the courses, right? They're the ones, um, but I also think it's important to have students that are in honors, um, uh, honors track, as Gary said as well, and then um, children who are, you know, not above average, but not below average. So I think the, they all need to be in that conversation as well, um, because if, you know, it, I think it gives an important lesson in, in ad, self advocacy um, and just perspective for the teachers and, and the parents and the students. Agreed, agreed. And I just I, I just want to make a, a clarification to a point I made earlier. Um, we are departmentalized on the fourth and fifth grade levels, but our fourth and fifth grade te uh, students have two teachers. Um, so the adjustment that is made when they move into sixth grade is that they have four different teachers in their four different content areas and they're moving about the building. So, but yes, that is true. There were a number of years ago, we went departmentalized to help ease that transition. Um, and also, as we know that uh, the content becomes a little bit more advanced, um, we understood that having teachers in the fourth and fifth grade levels who were felt more comfortable, right? Uh, whether it be with literacy or with mathematics made sense. So I am aware of that, um, just wanted to note that. Hi, I, I just wanted to interject that as we look back at the um, responses from our staff that serving specialized pop student populations ranked second. And so I think that that is really top of mind for everyone, um, whether we're looking at our ELL students or whether we're looking at our honors students. Um, teachers being able to manage all of the levels um, is, is a task that uh, professional development is always welcomed. Um, and so I think we're on the right track there. All right, I just wanted to acknowledge, we, we did have a couple of other comments uh, uh, about honors in particular. And I just wanted to state out loud that we see the comments and acknowledge them and those will go into our notes uh, as we move forward, but we really wanted to keep to a higher level um, focus on, uh, on goals. And so noted that learning acceleration honors or topics that we should be considering as priorities. Uh, I'm going to ask that we sort of keep that at a high level for this particular discussion. And then ask, um, uh, Anyone who has not yet had an opportunity to raise your hand to speak or to type in a question, uh, maybe we'll give it another minute before we move on. And I wish I had brought my harmonica. We actually have someone who has raised their hand to, um, to speak. Um, so Simona Chindea, uh, pardon if I've pronounced that incorrectly, if you follow the prompt on your screen, Yes, hi, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon. I would like to start by um, thanking um, everyone, especially Dr. Cascone, for removing the mask for the kids outside the schools. It's just such a 
big step forward in, in seeing those children enjoying the break in the in the sun out there and, and enjoying their company. Um, I would like to know what's going to happen next and um, why do we start the schools in September with the masks on when we do not know what happens in two months from now? Um, also, um, can we have from the nurses a, um, um, a study showing that, um, that masks work? Um, then um, I would like to um, ask why do we have, uh, are, why are we given such a high priority to equity versus equality? Why do our students need to know about this? They are not mutually exclusive, I understand that. Uh, but as another superintendent stated a couple of um, days ago, um, equity is about removing obstacles. And this is our duty as parents as ed and educators. We remove the obstacles so the children can thrive for excellency. Now, why do they need to know that they might not be at the same level because they come from a different environment and um, they have a different color of their skin or they speak, I don't know, with an accent or they are poorer or, or richer than the others. We do not need this. Why don't we replace that with diversity and unity? Um, this, this situation is, is so stressful that they don't need to be aware of these details. We need to put in the work for them with the resources that we have so they can they can thrive so they can meet uh, uh, their their challenges with success. Um, last but not least, I would like to um, to ask you to keep to keep our holidays in the calendar. This is a uh, um, 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 something that defines um, our culture, our nation. Um, something that we live honoring. Uh, something that um, it's. Um, it's underpinning our everyday existence. Um, also, um, if you could clarify whether um, we still use the computers in the fall, because our little children had enough of that. They, they need to know how to, to live a normal life in school and um, to be able to write a letter in the absence of a computer, to be able to connect without having to press so many buttons because they are getting better than we are when it comes to uh, manipulating these devices. And um, they, they really do not need that. They need to, to stay creative. They need to be children. They, they need to be kind. And um, one last point, um, is there any chance that we keep these children for let's say elementary school in the same class during the years because this is the, these are the, the times when, when they bond, when they create long lasting rela relationships. Um, and, and me as a grown up, I have friends since kindergarten, since second grade, more than I have friends from high school. And I guess you can confirm that. Um, once again, I would like to, to thank you for, for taking this, uh, this step forward to, to let them be themselves and, and let us see their faces that motivate us to, to, to embrace any challenge that comes our way. And hopefully starting September, we remove those plexiglasses as they don't need it. These children are not affected. We had two cases of children affected by COVID. They are the ones that are less affected by it but the ones that suffer the most. And our hearts are broken to see that they wake up and they know it's another day that they cannot be themselves in schools. So thank you once again. Um, God bless you for, for all the efforts that you put in to keep this year going as it was not an easy one for any of us. And um, hopefully, hopefully we, we can see each other in person next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I feel like, um, thank you for all the, the questions. I feel like that was maybe uh, uh, looking forward to the, um, the open comment section of the meeting, which, uh, which will come next after the presentation. But I wonder if, uh, if anyone on the board uh, uh, can, can recommend, uh, you know, or maybe just make note and we'll collect that for next time about 
teasing out uh, ideas for goal setting uh, from the many comments. I mean, I'm I'm really hearing, I think, again, in that in that larger category of school reopening and social emotional, um, uh, uh, creating a, a, a healthy social emotional environment for our students and meeting their emotional needs after the suffering that many of them have gone through uh, over the last school year. Um, anything that anyone would uh, would add to to those thoughts, and then maybe what we should do is move uh, conclude this part of the presentation and open it up to uh, to general public comment. Um, I had one thing that I wanted to say. I do um, thank you for calling in and not being shy to speak up, and it's really important um, to be involved and be vocal, um, and in a good way, right? Not just um, not just in a negative light, but um, encouraging each other to do, um, to be involved. Um, I do, one thing that um, Mrs. Chande uh, mentioned was uh, that our kids need to stay creative. That hasn't been mentioned in the survey or it wasn't, um, that was one thing that did catch my attention because um, I think sometimes in, in terms of de-stressing and um, and you know, being stuck in front of a monitor, the arts, um, we kind of overlook sometimes um, that the kids need arts and, and um, all of the programs that we have at the, at the high school level, we do have a lot. Um, and I think that we need to continue seeing that in the younger levels uh, in a, a way that children can express creativity. Um, I, have a, I have children that doodle, um, one, one of my, whoa, Sorry, my lights keep going out in this room. <laughs> One of my children, um, he doesn't color, but he doodles. So it's it's really funny to watch his uh, versus one of my other children. Um, they like to color in very vivid and detailed. And so they, there's a different, um, I think that sparks the creativity. Um, and so that was one thing that um, I hadn't heard in the previous comments, the creative aspect. So thank you for that. Um, and one thing that also caught my attention was our holidays on the calendar. Um, this has been uh, something that I've seen uh, come up in different conversations um, that we need to be uh, more diverse in, in the kind of holidays that we acknowledge and celebrate. Um, even just naming them on the calendar, I think would make a big difference and help in the sense of being inclusive, um, not necessarily having days off for them, but just acknowledging them and. Uh, making it a point and having different kinds of um, arts and crafts that are related to other holidays and other cultures um, in the community and in the world in general. So thank you for that, Mrs. Chendea. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Um, there, there were a few um, points uh, Ms. Chendea made that if you would mind. Of course. I know they were kind of framed in some ways or in kind of the public uh, feedback uh, kind of public comment section, but I think they're certainly worth speaking to a little bit. Um, so the, the goal for opening next year is for it to be um, as, as, for lack of a better word, normal as possible, right? Um, one thing that I've been seeing um, in terms of the if you want to call it guidance coming from the state level or the lack thereof, is that school districts ostensibly are going to have um, a greater degree of latitude and freedom to be making you decisions on the local level. Again, informed by medical and public health experts. Um, and I think that's a good thing. You know, and, and I think we need to embrace that. And so um, after a couple of weeks of kind of continuing to wait, waiting for something definitive, um, we're not getting it. And that's OK. You know, that, that that's going we need to put together our teams over the summer um, and need to have as our primary focus. What can we do to be back in as normal a capacity as possible next year with the primary focus being five full days all day and then work backwards from that. Um, and understand what we need to ensure that we're doing that uh, safely. Um, I would envision that removal of barriers. And I don't want to go too far afield on this at this time, 
um, but normalcy is is the goal uh, for next year. Um, interesting with the computers, um, we did get a, a directive from the county that indeed virtual instruction outside of a declared state of emergency is not permissible. Um, we're not able to use it. Um, you know, that being said, an interesting nuance to that is, um, you know, would we foresee the possibility maybe in during cold and flu, we'll call it cold flu and COVID season, you know, when that, when that comes, um, and provided that the quarantine guidelines remain the same, they haven't changed the date, and we have a confirmed case of COVID in one of our classrooms, and as such, students that were in close proximity to that student, and that'll be a larger number of them because we will not be, most likely not be socially distanced to the extent we are now, would those students need to be quarantined? And would they need to be quarantined for the length of time? Of course, if they were vaccinated, they would not need to be, but if they weren't, um, they would need to be, would they need to be quarantined for 10 days? And how are we educating them for the 10 days that they're at home? Well, the logical explanation would be that we would flex to a hybrid model. So my thought on it is, is all of our classrooms have to have the capacity to do that, but we would only do it if it was necessary because of either a quarantine or in the case of maybe a student that had been determined to be medically fragile, not able to come in. But the primary mode is our traditional brick and mortar mode with the ability to flex and pivot into a hybrid mode, whether for one student, two students, the entire class if necessary. Um, but it would be back to primary, more traditional type of learning. And I think it's a good point. We, we would really try and minimize to some extent, the amount that students were on technology in school, certainly for those opening months. Um, interesting, interesting feedback on the equity versus equality piece. And it reminds me of the idea of, of surplus perspective as opposed to deficit perspective. And that's the mindset we're trying to change because too, too often when we think about um, different subgroups of students, we see them through a deficit lens, that there's something that we need to fix as opposed to looking at those students and seeing their strengths and seeing what they bring to the table and embracing that and building that, right? Um, but certainly we don't, I can assure you, we don't, um, you know, outside of the fact that ESL students are in an ESL program and special needs students might be in a special needs program, um, but you're right. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's in some ways sort of a culture that we need to change and it speaks to a culture of inclusivity where all groups um, feel celebrated, welcome, and supported. So we're, we're definitely speaking the same language on, on that um, on that topic. Um, and I think that um, I think that that those were a few that jumped out at me. If there was another one the board felt was mentioned that might merit my my feedback comments. No. Uh. But another, um, she, uh, Mrs. Oh, yeah. Chandaya mentioned um, masks. Um, yeah. A, a study, perhaps, or maybe we, perhaps we can do another town hall. I think a lot of people seem to yeah. like the town, the medical town halls. Yeah, you know the, it, it, you know, I think what's been, right. So I think what's made this year challenging, and what's going to make next year much easier is that we'll be able to conclude this year and be able to evaluate um, all the different things that have been said, all the different research, and be able to chart a fresh course from, start, from the start, informed by all of that, as opposed to making these change and pivots with the ever shifting and changing guidelines. The challenge with masks is, is that there are, there's research on both sides, right? And I think that's where it creates sort of a disconnect in folks' minds. I think the, the, the direction it seems to be moving is, um, though I can't say this for sure, but it seems to be moving in this direction, which is if you feel comfortable wearing a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, don't, right? Um, and I, I do believe that that's the direction that it's headed, though we have not received any guidance specifically for that. If you look at the, go the governor's more recent one, I mean, his order was fairly clear that was what it represents a health hazard, excessive heat. And then there were districts that just cast cast masks aside, regardless of that, um, you know. But I'm I'm hopeful that it'll be an individual discretion um, as far as mask wearing, um, and in the event that 
that's not specifically told to us by the state authorities, that'll be a, uh, a that'll be kind of an angle that I'm looking to explore with our own local uh, Department of Health to understand if um, they would they would subscribe to and support um, a dis, you know an individual discretion approach to masks. I think that makes the most sense. Um, so again, uh, as much normalcy as possible. That's the goal. Yes, um, Dr. Kesko, and I think Ms. Shandaya also mentioned students remaining in the same class. Now, in, in educational jargon, that's called looping, where students stay together. Um, would you like to address that? I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the building of classes, um, well, looping is, you know, where they would, is also where the, um, you know, the teacher follows them up as well. Um, I can say that, that that's, you know, that's not something we would do across the board, although there are some cases where it's, it's done. In terms of keeping the entire class together, um, I do believe that it's, it, there's always an effort to try and keep a core of students together, but there are um, a lot of different factors that, that go into, you know, building the class lists for the, you know, the, um, uh, for the following year. Um, and, um, you know, it's something I can speak to the principals about, but, um, you know, that is kind of a complex process of building the class for the next year. But I do know that they do, they do make an effort to keep a core of kids together. And the other thing to consider, particularly when it comes to elementary school, is that, you know, the nature of the, of the, um, the elementary school experiences is, you know, because this, the schools are relatively small, um, you know, the kids, you know, in the same grade level, you know, have a good amount of interaction. Um, and so, you know, unlike, say, for example, in a high school where if you happen to not have a class with your, your, your buddies, you, you could conceivably not see them the entire day. Um, that isn't necessarily the case, but certainly something that I can kind of knock around with the principals at the, uh, at the next principal meeting. Hey, there was a piggyback to Dr. Cascone's comment. How will information about children's uh, staff vaccination status be collected as they do not need to quarantine if exposed? Yeah, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, as far as, um, you know, if, if we got into, yeah, I think that would be on a case by case basis, right? So if we have a situation where <clears throat> we have a, you know, we have a, um, a student who's confirmed um, and we have several, you know, we have say three students who are determined to be close contacts. Um, you know, if the, you know, it would be like, well, you know, if you are vaccinated, you need quarantine and there would need to be uh, proof, right? They would need to, they would need to furnish, um, you know, evidence of documentation, their CDC vaccination card um, in order to, um, to back that up. Um, failure to be able to provide that um, would, um, would necessitate a quarantine. Um, there are, I, I do understand that all, anyone who's been vaccinated is also in a, um, a state database. Um, and so if for whatever reason, a person, you know, indicated that they had lost their card or something of that nature, the local department of health could, um, you know, could confirm that through the state database. But if, if it would be based upon that, if the, if the person it was in a situation where they were indicated they needed to quarantine, um, they would ultimately have to furnish that information. To date, due to the fact that it is still an emergency, uh, emergency approved vaccine, there are, there are, uh, it is, it is to date, um, not um, a mandatory vaccine, like many of the other vaccines, um, like, for example, TB uh, for, for both staff and, and students and the other battery of vaccinations that students must demonstrate uh, documentation in order to enroll. To date, that is not the case for COVID-19, and I understand that as a, as a result of the fact that it is approved only for emergency use. At such time that it goes beyond that, that might change, but for the time being, that's not the case. So if I could jump in for just a moment. There are a couple of other uh, um, comments in Q&A, but I wanted to state, I, I think that they're really more general, um, uh, general comments and less uh, in response to the goal setting exercise for this evening. So I wanted to check in with my fellow board members and see, are you okay with moving to conclude um, the, this first section of the goal setting presentation and then we can move into our open comment? 
section. I'm seeing heads nodding yes. Okay. So, um, uh, so Ms. Grafties, if you would uh, advance the slide, please. Uh, we'll go to one last slide before we conclude. And Jennifer, I don't remember which of us was doing this. Is this mine? Oh, you're muted. I think I, I, I'll just uh, jump in and go ahead. Um, so, so just a, 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 a quick um, overview of what our next steps are. Um, having, uh, you know, again, seen the survey results and had the opportunity to get some additional feedback this evening. Um, the administrative team has a retreat on June 29th where they will be discussing any number of issues and goal planning and goal setting for the upcoming school year. And the, the board will develop our set of goals for the upcoming year and look to have both of those approved at our July meeting. Um, these goals will be, many of you are familiar with the term SMART goals. Uh, they need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Um, these uh, goals are set for, for the course of a year and we really want very badly to make sure that we can achieve these goals and, um, uh, and make a difference and make ongoing improvement. So we'll be following those principles as well. And we'd also like to give um, a, a mid-year update. We'll have to schedule that specifically, but a mid-year update on the progress that we've made so far on our goals, uh, uh, just to keep the members of the public apprised of, uh, of where we're at uh, uh, with the goals that we ultimately decide to set for the upcoming school year. And that does it for the, uh, for the presentation uh, and for this section on goal setting. Thank you so much for your participation. And um, I will turn it back over to President Trig Scales uh, to bring us back into our agenda. Thank you well, so much. Thank you, Mr. Rothstein and Vice President Tunnycliffe. Um, we do know that putting that uh, slide presentation together, I think you were working into the wee hours, getting it uh, ready for us this evening. So thank you so much. And again, thank you to uh, Ms. Merklinger and Ms. Huerta um, for your role in getting that survey pushed out. And thank you to the folks who joined us tonight. Um, we were extremely happy that you took time out on such a beautiful evening uh, to spend with us and to everyone who did participate in the survey. Um, oftentimes, when you set a goal, um, you have all intentions of fulfilling that goal at the, at the end of that uh, school year. Sometimes you'll realize that you need to carry over a board goal. And I just wanted to point out that that has been the case with us. Um, the last couple of years as we moved to the Strauss S. May uh, policy manual. And so sometimes goals take two years to accomplish. Sometimes you can get them done within the one year. Um, the administration under Dr. Cascone's guidance will be working very diligently and uh, the board alongside, we will be working on formulating our goals for the year. And uh, as um, Vice President Tunnycliffe said, once we get some draft, then that's going to go back and we will have our students take a look at it because they, uh, they are the end users of all the work that we do and it is for their benefit that we are all here. And so now we're going to move into the next segment which is uh, questions from the public on any item that's uh, not district goal related. And I think we've already entered into that territory with um, a couple of our prior questions. But if there are other questions at this time, we are happy to entertain them. So Ms. Gravtiza, thank you. Sure. And yes, this is not the time to use Q&A. This is time to use the raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen. And you'll be put in a queue and we will ask for your name and address for the record. And you'll have three minutes for your question. And at this time, uh, if we have any takers for this section of the meeting, you can just uh, raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Rachel Keen, if you can please follow the prompt on your screen and give us your name and address for the record. Hi, Rachel Keen, um, 22 Schmidt Road. Thank you. Um, thank you for having this meeting. Um, I, I more have a general comment than a question. 
Um, and I think that as a parent, um, this past year and a half has been extremely difficult um, for all of us, uh, everyone who has children, um, no matter their ages, it's just been very challenging. Um, I don't think that a single child has come out of this unscathed, even the ch children who have had the best of this experience, whose parents have kept their jobs, who haven't experienced personal loss. Um, and, uh, you know, I was driving my son home the other day and he told me um, kind of out of the blue that he's not allowed to give hugs to his classmates in preschool. Um, and I was kind of taken aback by that uh, as I think that this is a new rule um, for him. And um, I've noticed things kind of have opened up across the board and except things for children. So um, mm. I, I take him to the doctor and the play place at the doctor's office is still wrapped up in plexiglass. Uh, not plexiglass, I'm sorry, saran wrap. <laughs> um, it's just these little things. And um, he's, he's so little that it's, you know, something he'll probably not, it won't stay with him psychologically, emotionally. He's giving hugs to people outside of school, but he thinks of school as a place where he can't give hugs. <laughs> and that's just how it is. That's the rule. Um, so I guess my comment um, is that I just hope that we can, as a community, look, really look at how well we are doing right now. Our COVID numbers are excellent. Our vaccination rates are excellent. And um, it's so important that we put our children first next year and, um, you know, just embrace um, how well we're doing, you know, in terms of everything. So that's all I just wanted to say. Hey, thank you. And do we have anyone else at this time using the raise your hand function located at the bottom of your screen? If you don't see it, you just want to move your mouse or touch your screen and it'll appear on the bottom for you. Thank you, Krista Puncelon. Puncelon, sorry, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly. If you can give us your name and address for the record after you push that prompt on your screen. Hi, yes, Krista Puncelon. I live at 19 Colony Drive East. Thank you. Um, so I'm just concerned to hear that masks might be a personal decision next year, especially since I have elementary school children who will not be fully vaccinated. How are we going to protect these kids? And for families that won't have a virtual option next year, because it sounds like that's not going to happen, um, how do we make them feel comfortable if we're not requiring masks of all the children that are not vaccinated? Is that your final statement? It is, sorry, okay. yes, thank you. Thank you, no problem. <laughs> they, uh, they answer at the end. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, oh, and don't worry about the prompt that I just sent you, I sent you that by accident. Uh, next we have Sarah, it just says Sarah, so if you can follow the prompt on your screen and give us your name and address for the record, please. Sure, this is oh. Milk Ridge Road. I'm sorry, we actually lost you when you stated your name and your address. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, Sarah During 47 Oak Ridge Road. Thank you. Um, I was actually just wondering, I had asked this question in the chat, but um, it, it wasn't, I guess, enough about goal setting, but is there any thought being given to alternatives to getting rid of honors, social studies and science in sixth grade, like such as making the program less about tracking and more about allowing students to self-select into honors classes each year. Because I feel like when we have committees on this topic, it's something that parents have brought up, self-selection. Um, and I, I just feel like if we're gonna have committees on it, we should really delve into that and whether or not it could work. I know they do it in some surrounding towns and it would take a lot of the anxiety out of the process. As long as a student is performing in non-honors classes at an A or B level, if we make it less about tracking and more about each year the child could decide to challenge themselves, that really would teach the students that they can do hard things. And it would teach them that maybe this year, okay, it isn't for me, but next year it could be. 
Whereas now I feel like there's so much anxiety built into like the testing and am I going to get the recommendation? And, and I just feel like it's unnecessary anxiety for parents and for students, because every year the process seems to change and confuse the crap out of people. So that's all I wanted to say. Hey, thank you. Um, next we have Lauren Weinshank. If you can follow the prompt on your screen and give us your name and address for the record, please. Lauren Weinshank, Six Cray Lane, West Orange. I'd just like to say thank you for having this meeting. I'd actually like to piggyback on what Sarah said about honors. My son was in a unique situation this year because he was in sixth grade. So there was no testing for honors in fifth grade. So I believe this was the only year that that class entered Edison without testing. And it was basically based on teacher recommendation and grades and self-selection. We were able to be told what he qualified for based on teacher recommendation and grades and pick. That being said, he did pick two honors classes in Edison and he excelled. They were absolutely phenomenal. A huge shout out to the Edison teachers. And I have to say, I don't know if he would have passed the standardized test to get into those honors classes. So now he is on the honors track, but I honestly don't know if it would have happened if it wasn't for COVID in this situation. And I think that speaks to a lot of the children um, and possibly a lot of the children this year. I can tell you that, um, you know, based on what I saw, I really don't believe he would have passed the map. So maybe as there were so many horrible things about COVID this year, that is something that can really be looked at for this specific class um, moving forward, uh, as I think it could be a positive to show that. Um, and then just one more comment with the end of the year activities, it's brought up that there seems to be an inequality in which certain schools can do what. And I was just hoping next year as we move into normalcy that it's a across the board rule. Um, Edison again has been absolutely phenomenal and they're hosting wonderful end of the year programs that when we asked at our elementary school, we were told those weren't allowed. So obviously they are allowed, um, it's just different of opinion. So, I hope next year that there's more across the board as we go back into normalcy, but thank you so much. Hey, thank you. And at this time, this will be the final call for anyone who would like to speak um, on any subject using the raise your hand button located at the bottom of your screen. And if you are our call in a patron who I see now, it is star nine on your telephone. Okay, and Simona Chindea, if you can follow the prompt on your screen and give us your name and address for the record. So Simona Chindea, uh, 33 Deerfield Drive. Just a quick question. Um, we have a graduation for a senior this year. Um, I would like to know um, whether we can attend um, free of any restrictions since uh, those vaccinated are protected and those that are not um, are trusting their own immune system with this. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And it looks like um, that is the last of the um, hands raised. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gratis, and thank you um, to our members of the public um, who raised some questions for us. And as usual, I'm going to defer to Dr. Cascone initially. Thank you, President Trigscales, and uh, thank you uh, for all the um, questions, um, good questions and comments. Um, right, so Ms. Bunsalan, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good point. And I just wanna reiterate that um, that you know, based upon what we're seeing occurring in um, other settings, right? So, and I, and I think I'm, I'm not sure which which uh, community member it was that said it. It was Miss Keen, Miss Keen, who said, you know, we see things opening up and last really last for kids, right? So, um, you know, when the um, you know when the data shows us that um, not only are younger children less apt to uh, spread the virus, um, but also that, um, you know, obviously it, the, the physical impacts on children um, as evidenced in the CDC's own data shows that um, other than in cases of students with uh, comorbidities or medical fragility, 
um, students, uh, young children seem to be relatively um, minorly impacted by the disease. Yet, um, you know, we see, you know, bars, you can sit at a bar, right? I don't, um, it's not my thing, but, um, but you can sit at a bar arm in arm with a perfect stranger having a drink, pack bar, concert halls, stadiums, right? Um, mass free, right? So I, I think um, it's, it's, it's definitely something where whatever we do, whatever chart uh, course we chart is going to be uh, done inclusively. Um, it's going to be done in collaboration with uh, the local department of health um, and our district physician. Um, and, um, you know, so these, these, these are possibilities. We still remain hopeful that we might get some additional guidance from the state, but understand that, you know, we, we want everyone to feel comfortable and safe um, when they come to school. Um, and I think that that's a, a, just a good segue to the last question, and I'll come back to the ones in the middle relative to graduation, uh, which is, of course, um, you know, we, we, as it is an outside event, um, there are no masks required, um, of, you know, of uh, any, any participants outside unless they chose to wear one. Um, but we are keeping a critical eye on that piece that we understand that there are folks in our community um, who, you know, who are not and that's including inclusive of students as well as community families um, who would not necessarily be comfortable attending a ceremony in a packed set of bleachers with strangers. Students who would not necessarily be comfortable, um, you know, becoming a sea of humanity of thousands of people at the culmination of a ceremony. Um, and so, you know, our approach to graduation this year is let's ensure that it is an event which is with which everyone who participates feels comfortable, feels safe, and that we know we've controlled for all variables, whether that be crowd control, whether that be um, you know, safety relative to the virus, um, and that the experience will be safe and meticulously organized with no, uh, no, no uh, unforeseen challenges or, or risks associated with it. You know, the, 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 the relative to the, the honors, you know, it's, it's such an interest, it, it really is such an interesting and complex conversation, right? Because, um, you know, and I've, I've talked about this before, uh, relative to honors and gifted and talented is, you know, when I look at some of the things that we do in gifted and talented and some of the things that we do in honors, and I'm thinking these are terrifically engaging activities that are certainly accessible to regular education students. So I, I think it's, there's, a, there's a big question about why, why are we not bringing an honors approach, particularly in the middle grades, maybe not necessarily as much in the high school level there as well, there, because you know, we start to get into AP and things of that nature. But in the middle grades, why are we not bringing that essence of honors to every class? And when you start thinking about that, then it raises the question, well, then what is honors, right? And to some extent, the revision of the standards, you know, we talk about the next generation science standards, which are the standards that apply to all students, regardless of honors, or, or if they're in a regular level of class, those are high level rigorous standards. So the question becomes, what, what is honors then, right? So it's, it, it's complex. Um, I think it, it, it necessitates putting heads together, you know, we're not averse to the idea of self-selection. I'm thrilled to hear, Mrs. Wanshank, that your son had a, a great experience. And, and I think it's, it's very interesting to the idea that he may not necessarily have made it if there was a test, but yet did well. So I think that story, that personal anecdote about your son um, is, is rationale right there for us to kind of open this thing up and have a good conversation about it and an inclusive conversation about it. Definitely something that we need to do. Um, look, look at, start looking at practice, right? What, what are some best practices in the industry, you know, in, in the profession? You know, what are, what are school districts that have gone through this process? We have, just as a final point on that, we, we have a partnership with Hanover Research and it's a research partnership. Um, and we could work with them on that. They could do just an unpacking of our honors program um, and provide us with, you know, hundreds of case studies from around the country 
and looking at other types of programs around, you know, by which we might want to restructure ours. So suffice to say, it's something we need to take a closer look at, um, you know, moving into into next year. Um, and I think that um, I know Mrs. Wanchank had also mentioned the idea of end of year activities. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, it's difficult. I know that, that Edison, um, you know, in the sixth grade, um, they did a number of things there. I, my understanding is that every school has, you know, has had some form of a, you know, uh, whether it was a movie night or a festival or a fun day, um, you know, in terms of establishing consistency across schools. I think there's something to be said for that, something we can certainly discuss with principals moving forward. That's all I have, President Trick Scales. Thank you, Dr. Cascone. Um, I'm going to take the liberty just to see if uh, board members have a parting uh, short comment um, before we adjourn. So, Ms. Huerta. I believe, mm, um, Melinda, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, can you plug in, plug in back your um, microphone? Because you are on mute. Oh, there you are. Can you can speak you again? Me? Yes, now we can. Okay, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, thank you, President uh, Terry Trick Scales. Dr. Cascon, did you need to say something else? I heard you. You know what? Be jump I, up. <laughs> I always get, I get, I always get so so wrapped up in the business that I forget. You know some 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 just little messages that uh but i have to just give a shout out to our seniors um tonight and uh, I, I i would have loved to have actually stopped by the prom but you know the meeting but you know uh, i hope they're having a grand old time at that senior prom um and i'm sure they look great and uh you know just want to thank the the birchwood manor where where it's being hosted they were very generous with the accommodations and of course, to the high school team for uh, for organizing that. So I wish them all the best, a safe and, and very enjoyable evening tonight. That was all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cascone. And thank you, President uh, Trick Scales. Um, just thank you everyone for participating and calling in. Um, and one comment I just wanted to say, um, I say this, I think often uh, people will take kindness for weakness, um, but it is sometimes very difficult to be kind, especially when you're being scrutinized or um, things aren't going your way, you're having a bad day or a bad week or a bad year, right? Like we've all just had, I think. Um, and so I think it has to do a lot with framing and how you frame things. Um, because yes, we can see everything as a difficulty and, um, sort of get stuck in that rut of this is terrible, everything is terrible, um, but then also you have to gradually kind of dig yourself out of that or help children to kind of, yes, you are upset, feel your emotion, feel the upset or feel the anger or frustration, and then guide them into getting out of that. Um, something that I need to work on myself, but <laughs> um, thank you everybody for uh, joining us and being involved and participating and um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Huerta. Uh, Ms. Merklinger? Um, I know we have a meeting on Monday, so I'll save my, my comments for Monday, but um, I did just want to thank everyone that joined in tonight and spoke, whether it was by the chat or Q&A um, or raising their hands. Um, and I just hope that the seniors are having a great time tonight. Um, I got sent a few pictures already and it looks like everyone's having a great time and outside and um, I just hope everyone's, you know, gets to enjoy it. So um, more, hopefully more events and I've seen a lot of pictures from different school activities um, to what some of the, the community members mentioned, um, just different events happening all over the schools and it's great to see that and see the smile. So um, keep up the great work everyone and we'll see you Monday night. Thank you, Ms. Merklinger. Uh, uh, Mr. Rothstein. I'm all talked out. You sure? No, I'm sure, <laughs> thank you. We appreciate all the talk today. <laughs> and uh, Vice President Tony Cliff. Thank you, President Trick Scales. Um, thanks to our community members who were here tonight and shared with us. We really appreciate all your comments and um, 
you know, we look forward to sharing with you our goals uh, sometime after July, maybe in the August or September, early September meeting. And, um, you know, certainly if you think of something, feel free to email us. Our email addresses are on the Board of Ed website. Um, and you can, if you think of something that's related to um, our board goals, feel free to just reach out. Okay. And have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Tony Cliff. Um, I just wanted to add um, a quote, um, and it can fill in for honors, it can fill in for life. A rising tide lifts all boats. Um, so you can think about that one. Um, so our next meeting is on June 20. Mr. Rothstein? I'm so sorry. I just wanted to ask, since, <laughs> since it's happening on Saturday, can we get a reminder of the uh, school district event for Juneteenth? Juneteenth? I was just about to do oh, it. Oh, thank you so much. That's Sorry. okay. <laughs> um, so we do, our next meeting is on Monday and that is our parade of honors at 7.30. And that is going to be at the high school. And so we hope you'll come out and join us as we celebrate so many accomplishments of our, our students and staff. And on Saturday, which is Juneteenth, and I mentioned this the other night, there are a number of activities happening in town to celebrate um, the first state holiday of Juneteenth, which is Saturday, June 19th. And um, the school district is sponsoring an activity along with the African American Heritage Organization. Um, but unfortunately, it's sold out, but there's a lot going on going on at Colgate Park. There's a flag raising at noon, I think from 10 to 12, there are activities at the library. So please go on the um, HRC website. And at this time, um, I would like to entertain a motion for adjournment. I'll motion. Thank you, Ms. Huerta. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. This Aye. meeting is officially adjourned. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. And this is Thank to you. inform everyone that when I end the meeting, it will be, uh, it will end for those both on and off screen and no other business will be conducted. Thank you guys. Have a great Thank night. Thank you, Ms. Grove. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.